Well, if you had to wake up in this morning and say, what would be the biggest challenge you could attack in life? It would be to follow Gary at an AI conference. Uh, but let me just jump in right here. So I think by now we all know that there's an incredible amount of data and advances in acceleration technologies that are changing industries. And we're having more companies that aren't overwhelmed and are drowning in this data deluge, but instead they're talking about this insatiable desire and the information they're getting from more data. The more data, the more they learn. And soon we'll be hearing about digital companies moving to become AI companies. Now, it's true. We're just getting started. There's been people who've been working in AI for years, but the acceleration that we've been bringing to AI, the acceleration that's been coming for deep learning, is really new. It's only been about four years since Alice Kruchewski at the AI lab at the University of Toronto wrote software that allowed visual recognition to happen and learn by itself. The deep neural networks that came out of that actually were able to start doing pattern recognition by themselves. And so I would like to suggest that deep learning has gone through a change. It is now a new computing model where billions of software neurons and trillions of connections are trained in parallel. So despite the view that we're not ready for AI, I think AI is for everyone. We're hitting a point where AI is changing a lot of activities in a lot of industries. We're seeing it across so many different components that we're really going to expect big changes in the world. So let's go through a few. The transportation industry is one of the largest industries in the world. With $2 trillion in cars, $5 trillion in taxi and shuttle services, another $3 trillion in trucking, and you have a $10 trillion industry. And autonomous driving will usher in a world that is safer. Why? Because a car with AI will be always thinking. It will be always attentive. It will be always aware of its environment around it, and it never gets tired. It will have superhuman powers that will keep us out of harm's way. Now, an autonomous car is not a smart camera. It is not just a car with radar, because to have an AI car, you need to have more capabilities than just object detection and stopping the car. You have to be aware of the world around you. You have to perceive. You have to understand what's going on in the environment, and you have to make intelligent decisions. You have to have what Jan said, common sense. And common sense will come from having perception. Now, to have a high quality autonomous driving vehicle, you're going to need an AI supercomputer in the car. You're going to need an AI algorithm that is actually perceiving, reasoning, and then taking the appropriate action. And that AI algorithm in the car is going to link, need to link to an AI algorithm in the cloud, an HD cloud, that's going to give context for where the car is. It's going to be able to give the context around it. And that's why it's really exciting, the announcement between Baidu and NVIDIA, where we have an end-to-end -end system. And this is an open platform. Baidu is going to be using it for its own self-driving taxis and its own self-driving cars but it's going to be made available to others as well. Now, this is just one of the examples. We have Newtonomy in Singapore, where we have autonomous driving taxis already on the street. Volvo with the Drive Me cars, also already on the street. And WePods, which I actually think is really cool, because with your own smartphone, you're going to be able to hail a shuttle that's going to come pick you up and deliver you. And NVIDIA's BB-8. BB-8 wasn't programmed. BB-8 learned by watching people drive. And it wasn't hundreds of hours. Of hundreds of hours, BB-8 would clearly not go so well. But at 3,000s of hours, BB-8 actually does drive, drives down roads without lanes, drives on roads with snow, drives with roads when it's raining. Come by the booth here or at Strata, for those of you that will be doing both conferences, and we'd be happy to walk you through how we went through that process. Now, AI is also going to be changing the healthcare industry. AI will enable us to detect and diagnose diseases earlier because of your family heritage, because of symptoms, because of social determinants. 
And with the large amount of information that's available in publications and in research around the world, we're going to be able to put that and in artificial intelligence in the hands of the doctors. And they're going to be able to detect disease, diagnose disease, and give you treatments that are going to cure these diseases. Let's look at some of the examples that are in progress already. Lumiata. Lumiata is an AI-powered predictive analytics company. And they've created an incredible medical graph, which has hundreds of millions of data points that comes from sources such as patient care, doctor treatment logs, articles. And they put this into the graph, and the graph organizes and analyzes the information, which allows us to be better at identifying, prioritizing, and optimizing resources, both for patient care, but also for risk assessment. And this will be great addition to the healthcare industry as it helps us manage our costs, but at the same time give better services to our patients. Another example, embryotic AI. Embryotic AI was a collaboration of in silico medicine and biotime. Embryotic AI is an AI system that allows you to test and analyze human cell samples based on their gene structure. Now, this is a service that's going to be made available for scientists and companies around the world that can bring their cell samples and test and analyze them there. So BioTime has taken the largest collection of gene studies, and it's used it to train deep neural networks that actually are able to be the classifier and the predictor of the embryonic state. So why is this important? It just so happens that if we could unlock the regenerative powers of our embryonic components, we could actually address diseases differently. Serious injuries, age-related degenerative diseases, these could all be treated differently. Even cancer is open to the solution. Another solution, zebra medical vision. Zebra medical vision is using deep learning to train computers to read and diagnose medical images. Their algorithms help radiologists detect indications that are often overlooked. Their algorithms can be used across billions of records to actually predict patients' risk assessment and care. Let's look at one example, osteoporosis. Osteoporosis affects over 30% of women and 20% of men over the age of 50. Now, 80% of those afflicted with osteoporosis go undetected. They don't know they have it. But it also turns out that those who do have an osteoporotic fracture then experience a quick degradation in the quality of their life. 25% of those who have a hip fracture end up in a nursing home within 12 months. $17 billion a year is spent treating osteoporosis in the U.S. alone. So why? Why do we have this problem? It turns out that the way to test for osteoporosis is your bone density. And very few of us probably actually have our bone density checked on a regular basis. Well, Zebra has come up with an algorithm that allows you to test for osteoporosis using CT scan data that was performed for whatever reason. And it comes up with a result that is equivalent of your, your debt bone density T-score. This then can be applied across existing records to find at-risk patients. And the goal here is to reduce the number of fractures and reduce the number of costs. Very impressive indeed. So, the world has an aging population. One billion are going to be joining the middle class. One billion will be consuming more medical services. And this need for medical services is going to outpace the number of radiologists we have and the number of care providers we have. So I personally 
am excited about all the work that's being done and what I believe are the new caregivers of the future. And it doesn't have to take much time in Japan to see the level of effort and research that's being done and trying to understand how robots can help us in the future. Now, the first robot, the first AI robot, is the car. It is what we're going to be driving. It is what we're perfecting. It is what we're putting a lot of the effort into. But now we have researchers all over the world who are putting effort into teaching robots, or rather, letting robots learn intuitively by themselves. And now they can do things like screw a bottle cap on, nail a hammer, kick a soccer ball. But there will be a time, and it's coming, where robots, AI machines, can do the tasks that we do, to, to, to do the tasks that are too tedious for us to do, and to do tasks that are harmful for us to do. And in fact, they will be able to be caregivers to the elderly. They will actually give them a more productive life. And there's a lot of countries where that is extremely important. So AI is for everyone. AI will be everywhere. The number of examples and the efforts that are going into it will continue to bring new ideas. And we are in a world, and we've entered a world in the last four years in particularly, where GPU acceleration is giving more tools, is opening up the debate, is allowing us to see what is the potential of AI. And I contest that with AI changing healthcare and allowing us to live longer, I, for one, am extremely, extremely happy that we're going to be having self-driving cars and AI assistants to take care of us. We are entering a new world of compute, a new platform of compute. We're entering, I believe, the next generation of AI. And I'm very happy and proud to be working in this industry. Thank you so much.